Take your Bible, if you would, please, to the book of Job. I do not have that up on the screen, so you'll have to look at it in your Bible. Job chapter 5, if you would. Job chapter 5. There's an interesting thing that's always puzzled me in Job chapter 5 about God's people being as the... Um, Let's see here. Where does it say it? Yeah, verse 25, that an offspring as the grass of the earth. It's always got my attention. Thine offspring as the grass of the earth. I know that uh, Jesus talks about how God has blessed the fields and the grass of the earth and so on. But something interesting to me is that in Revelation 9, when these locust devils come up out of the pit, uh, we know by way of history and science that locusts, and when locust, when a locust plague comes in and moves across the land, they don't leave any grass and anything green in their path. They eat everything, as, and there are millions of them usually in one of these plagues that come across. They usually just eat everything that's green, everything they see. But... It's interesting in Revelation 9 that these locusts, they don't do that. They don't touch the grass of the earth. Specifically says that. They go after uh, all of those um, of mankind. I don't think it says that they have the mark of the beast by that time, Revelation 9. Uh, but they go after practically all of mankind except for those, I think it does say, those who have the seal of God in their foreheads or something like that, and they're not to touch the grass of the earth. And I've always wondered if there was a connection between that, Job chapter 5, that their offspring shall be as the grass of the earth. The offspring here that he's referring to is, um, let's pick it up, Job chapter 5, uh, verse 15. The Bible says, He saveth the poor from the sword, from their mouth, and from the hand of the mighty. So the poor hath hope, and the iniquity stoppeth her mouth. Aren't you glad God loves poor people? Amen, Amen to that. Now verse 17. Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. I want you to underline that in your Bible. Happy is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore, despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. Now, these were, of course, said by men who were saying this to Job because they thought Job had sinned some sin and that he was being chastened by God as a result of it. We know that's not the case. But what they're saying is not necessarily wrong. they just saying it to the wrong guy. Job should be saying it to them. But behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. And uh, I'm probably going to change the message topics next Sunday. And move to something else. And I'm going to finish this out today. About how God is raising me. How God has done it. How we're to raise children. Raise children in a godly home, how we're to do it, despite it, despite what the world says. Despise what your neighbor might think. Despise what, or despite what even family members might tell you. There is a right way to do this. There is a right way to chasten children and to correct them and punish them. Uh, for things that they do wrong and you are teaching them valuable lessons. Valuable lessons. I remember several years ago, we were going to go down uh, to the Dallas Training Center to be trained in the um, uh, um, ACE school program that we use for many years here. And they require, if you're going to have an ACE school, they require the the administrators to go and all the supervisors to go. They basically require everybody to go. 
which meant me. And part of their training, in fact, a big portion of their training, was that I was going to have to sit in a little office like we set up for them. And I had, they had mailed me the paces that I was to work on, which I didn't do until we got on the way to go down there. Because that was my habit. Didn't do the homework until the last possible second. So, I had talked to some people about the training. I, I said, is it any good? I said, boy, man, it's great. And they said, maybe you'll get Sarge. And I'm going, who? Oh, there's a guy who runs it. I mean, he's pretty tough. You could call him Sarge. I'm going, I don't want to meet nobody named Sarge. I'll tell you that right now. And what happened was, I had developed in my mind an attitude... Driving all the way down to Dallas, me and Sweetie Pie and Rose and some others going all the way down to Dallas, all the way down there. I've got an attitude. I don't have to do this stuff. What do I have to fill this stuff out for? It sound like a, sound like my boys used to sound. Why do I have to do this? And I'm going, they better not try to pull no attitude with me. I'll tell you that right now. And I mean, I just, I got, I was like a rebellious teenager. All the way down there. And then Monday morning, we walked in that beautiful learning center. Um, I mean, gorgeous learning center. It set me down at my desk and God softened my heart. And he said, Mike, you're here to learn. You're not here to tell them how to do their stuff. You're, you're here for them to tell you how to do it. And God softened my heart. Just, I mean, just like that, boom, I walk in there and there's a spirit in there. And it really softened my heart. And uh, by the end of the week, I learned how to push my chair all the way in. Listen, I'm not kidding. And that's part, believe it or not, it's part of it. Uh, my girls all know this. They, they, they all did it. My wife still gets after me because I get up from the doctor's office someplace somewhere and she'll say, you didn't push your chair in. <laughs> see? John, see? Yeah. But they... They pounded some things in me that week. And I learned because I got in trouble. I got in, tr I got in trouble that week because I didn't do what I was supposed to do the way they were telling me to do it. I got in trouble. And for that, I got detention. But on the way back, my wife will tell you, man, I was just going, man, I'm going to preach this when we get back. Man, this was awesome. I did. I come back and I preached Deuteronomy 6. I mean, I just, boy, it was good. But I, God reminded me again about chastening and correction. Don't despise it. Even as adults, eat, listen to me, even as adults, don't despise being corrected. Happy is the man whom God correcteth. Verse 18, for he maketh sore and he bindeth up. He woundeth and his hands make whole. Watch this now. Same hand that chastised you is the same hand that soothed you. God is built into the same skin where all those nerves are. Remember I told you that last Sunday? How your backside has a lot of fat and a billion nerve endings. Raw nerve endings, right up, pushed right up next to the skin. God put them right up there. So that when you are chastened, wham, it hurts. Same, same hand and the same nerve bundles are designed so that when that is gently rubbed, it takes the pain away. Did you know your brain can build its own morphine? It's called endorphins. And immediately when we get, like if we get stung by a bee or we get slapped or we get hit or we get cut or something like that, what's the first thing we start doing? It's, we don't even have to think about it. We don't have to sit and read a manual. What do I do next? It's built into us. God's shown us how it works.
same hand in the same way that God used to chasten us, God then soothes the hurt. He maketh sore and he bindeth up, he woundeth and his hands make whole. Verse 19, he shall deliver thee in six troubles, yea, seven. There shall no evil touch thee. You know why? You're God's child. God's not evil. God's not the evil one touching you. He's your father touching you. And your father got a right to touch you. Okay, but nobody else. Nobody else. In famine, he shall redeem thee from death, and in war, from the power of the sword. Thou shalt be hid from the scourge of the tongue. Thou shalt, neither shalt thou be afraid of destruction when it cometh. Some of us, we might get afraid that we're not going to get raptured at, at the right time we want to be taken out. Man, I've already been through deals where I would say, I want the rapture to happen. And it didn't happen. God didn't rapture me. God hid me. God has shown us that. Destruction and famine, thou shalt laugh. Neither shalt thou be afraid of the beasts of the earth. Think about that. Verse 23, for thou shalt be in league with the stones of the field. John the Baptist said, God is able to these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And the beasts of the field shall be at peace with thee. And thou shalt know that thy tabernacle shall be in peace. And thou shalt visit thy habitation and shalt not sin. Hey, it's worth it. Because now you're not going to sin anymore. Thou shalt know also that thy seed shall be great and thine offspring as the grass of the earth. Thou shalt come to thy grave in a full age like as a shock of corn cometh in his season. Lo, this we have searched it. So it is, hear it, and know thou it for thy good. Now remember, they're telling this to Job. God was not punishing Job. That was not the situation, but it doesn't make their words not true. Now turn over to Hebrews 12. I'll give you a minute or two to get there, and we'll go to the Lord in prayer. This message is the what if message. What if... What if chastening doesn't work? God does not make absolute guarantees that because you chastened a child that they're going to turn out all right. And some don't. Some don't. No matter what you do to them, no matter how much punishment you deliver, some don't turn out right. We tend to blame ourselves. I understand that. But when that child gets to an age... To where they're out on their own and they are not willing to be accountable for their wrongdoing. It really isn't your fault anymore. Those of you who are adults here. Do you not make your own decisions now? I mean your mommy doesn't call you. Get up now, it's time to go. And uh, it's your decision. You and you alone will be held accountable. And don't put it off on your parents, your upbringing, how bad it was. Hey, there's been good people come out of bad homes. Bad homes. Good people come out of them. And bad people come out of good homes. But this is really, you know, I've been preaching a long time. And I, as I said during Sunday school, I thought during my youth that everybody would listen to me and everybody would do what I've said. And that's not the case. 
So I want us to pray and consider God's word this morning, all right? Father in heaven, I love you, and I'd ask for your help uh, to preach this, because, Father, I've, I feel guilty. I'm preaching on this subject just about every time I've preached on it. I haven't done everything right, either as a child or as an adult, as a parent. I've not done everything right as a pastor. I've compromised. I've been too hard. And then I've been too soft. And I haven't done everything right. So, Father, it's best that I step back and you step in and you preach this the way you want it preached. Lord, I do believe these words are right and true or I wouldn't preach them. And I believe these words really identify and they help us identify, Father, the issues of life, the things that we run into, the people that we encounter. And I pray, Heavenly Father, God, that you would just help us, dear God, as we listen to your word and speak to us, God, that we despise not ever, ever despise your chastening. God, that we never turn away from your correction. We never pull away from you in rebellion. God, I do thank you for that day. You soften, you just, I mean, just like that, you softened my heart walking in that learning center. And you spoke to me, Mike, you're here to learn. God, it was one of the best weeks of my life. And I thank you for that. It's tremendous. I pray, Lord, that we would always be able to instill this in our children. Discipline brings self-discipline. Ruling over brings self-rule. Law brings liberty. Because while we're under the law, it teaches us right from wrong. We grow up to an age to where we do what's right because it's the right thing to do. That's, that's the way our heart is now inclined. Because, Father, you chastened us and you corrected us. And you drove that sin and that foolishness far away from us. So, Father, help us to either chasten ourselves or chasten us when we don't. Because we, we're done with sin. We want to be through with it. We want it to be gone. Gone out of our lives. Gone out of our families. Gone out of our households. Gone out of our churches. God, we want it to be gone. We see the effects that sin has. And they're no good. And Father, we pray for our children. Those that are still young. Father, that we make the least amount of mistakes, mistakes possible. It's not possible we're not going to make any mistakes. But, Father, we make fewer and fewer as we grow older in wisdom. And we raise children the right way. And that, Father, we learn, even as adults, how sometimes we need to be like children. To relearn some things. So, Father, just bless your word today. Preach it much better than I'm able to. We ask for your grace now, and we pray this in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3. Back in um, spring of last year, I preached a, a message called The Bastard of Bethel Church. And it, I don't use that term very often, but it is in the Bible, and it, and it means what you think it means. It is a curse word. And it, what it means in, the, in this sense is that you are not God's son. And because you are not God's son, um, then you will not receive the inheritance that belongs to God's son, which is eternal life in heaven. And again, this, this speaks right to the heart of the salvation issue. Is, is a person saved? Is a church member saved because they're a church member? If I'm saved, am I saved no matter what I do? Can I do whatever I want and still think I'm going to heaven? 
The answer to that is obviously no. Because if God cannot correct you, you are no son of His. He'll say, he'll say, he didn't, he'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. John said they went out from us because they were not of us. And so Hebrews chapter 12 verse 3, the Bible says, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. He's speaking that the context goes all the way back to Hebrews 11. And he's talking about this is what, what we call the Faith Hall of Fame. And um, he talks about in verse, if you look back in Hebrews 11, if you look in verse 34, or verse 33, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant, fight, turned to flight, the armies of the aliens, reverend received their dead, raised to life again, others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. I can tell you right now, that's not me. Not me and my flesh. Tortured, not accepting deliverance. That they might obtain a better resurrection. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. If you ever read what Paul said he went through. Thrice. Thrice delivered. What? No, five times. Five times delivered stripes. Thirty-nine save the one. Three times shipwrecked. Spent a night and a whole day out at sea. Floating in the water out at sea. Not knowing from day to day whether he was going to live. Then had a whole city. He said we had a whole city cordoned off by soldiers because they were looking for me and they lowered me down a window through a basket in a basket outside the city wall for my escape. He said the number of times I should have been dead, the number of times I was beaten, the number of times I was tortured, the number of times I spent in jail. And I'm reading this and I'm going... God, that ain't me. I am not Rambo, I can tell you that. But that's what he says here. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. We're not living in a much moral, better society. We're living in a much more wicked society that every day increases its hatred of those who believe the Bible. You need to get this in your mind. There are more of them than there are of us. And he said, you have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. No, we haven't. We haven't been persecuted the way others have. We've not been tortured. We've not been beaten for our faith like other, it, in, to, even in today's world. Who have been beaten and tortured for their faith. We've not ever had that. You've not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And yet we complain, we get a little spiritual hangnail, and we start throwing a fit with God. God, why'd you do this to me? Like we've got something to complain about. You've forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, my son, God says to you, despise not the chastening of the Lord. And he gets that from Job. Nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Every one of us, every one of us will get the rod of correction. And if you don't, you're not God's son. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If, verse 7, if, that if is attached to salvation. If you endure chastening. God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is whom whom the father chasteneth not? But, verse 8. There's a but. But if. But and if are part of it. But if ye be without chastisement. Whereof all are partakers. Then are ye bastards and not sons. When it comes to chastisement, when it comes to God's correction, let him do it. 
when it comes to trials, when it comes to things, and, and you will know at the time, I guarantee you, you'll know at the time. When I got off the school bus and I walked in the door and my mama grabbed me with that flame in her eye, it wasn't like I was going, what did I do? I knew exactly what it was. And if I didn't, mom always had a way of reminding me with every stroke, I want you to stop this, it, you know. Let God do it. You are going to have bad days. You're going to have bad times. You're going to have people turn against you. You're going to have, you're going to have, you're going to be rejected by this. You're going to be kicked out of that. That, those things have got to happen. This nonsense that's preached out of these multi-million dollar mega churches is not the right gospel. It says if you're a, Son of God, then you should live in comfort, lavishness. Never be despised by anyone, liked by everyone, including Oprah Winfrey. If Oprah likes you, well, then everybody ought to like you. If Oprah likes you, then Whoopi Goldberg will like you. And if Whoopi Goldberg likes you, then I'm telling you, you ain't right with God. Amen. Amen. But God's got to chasten you. Depending on the amount of sin and rebellion that's in you is the amount of chastening that you're going to get. If he does, God deals with you as with children. But if you be without chastisement, verse 8, we're of all partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. Furthermore, verse 9, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. We gave them reverence. The reverence is due. But we gave it to them. I mean, have you not heard children at Walmart curse their mom and dad? Rose wants to whip them. Don't you, Rose? Rose says, oh, I'd whip that child. Ro now, Rose wants... She knows about this. Her daddy... Whipped her a red spot the day she got married. Right? Huh? Day before. Close enough. Within 24 hours. It'll count. And it was, I'm sure it was like, you may be getting married tomorrow, but you still under my house today. You're going to live by my rules. Yeah, I, I, I was right in guessing that. We have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. It is a sin for a child to curse his mother and father. It is a sin to not give honor to your father and your mother. Amen. It's in the commandments. It is a sin to rebel against your parents. It is a sin to not receive their correction. It is a sin to not give them that joyful love and respect that children ought to give to their parents. And it is a sin... For people to not do likewise with their loving Heavenly Father. And he said, uh, verse 9, We've had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he... For our profit, that we might be partakers of His holiness. In other words, I mean, I might have whipped one of my kids because I was mad. And they say, don't whip your kids when you're mad. That takes the fun out of it sometimes. But I might have whipped my kids when I was mad. God never, has never done that with me. He's never taken his anger out on me the way I justly deserved it. He has chastened me with a very restrained, loving hand. Knowing that his 
that his love for me overrides the sin that I committed, he is still going to give me everlasting life. But he is going to train me not to act that way ever again. It may take a few trips around. It may take a while. But after, after a while, even some of the hardest of children give in and say, I don't want no more whippings. Of course, don't be like one of my good friends out at Bible college, a man by the name of Craig Shaw. He won't mind me telling this because he used to tell it all the time. He was a wrestler in high school, fifth in the nation. He was a pretty stout young boy. His dad was a preacher, Brian, and he said he just got to the day he decided he wasn't going to cry when his dad whipped him no more. And he said, sure enough, he'd come home, he got in trouble, did something, probably one of his, his brother or something like that. He got in trouble and his dad told him to bend over and he took his belt off and whipped him. And he said, I just gritted my teeth. But I didn't cry and he said, made dad mad and he whipped me all the harder. And he said, I wasn't going to cry. And he said, I didn't, I didn't cry no more after that. He said, but it sure hurt. Don't be, don't be like that. Don't, don't do that. Kids, don't do that. I'm trying to save your life here. For verily, listen, verse 10. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening. Listen, underline this in your Bible. Go back and read it again later. Go back and read it again tomorrow. Next week sometime when you really need it. Now no chastening for the present. Seemeth to be joyous. But grievous. If it ain't grievous, it don't work. If it don't hurt, it don't work either. If you just give them a little pat. And it didn't hurt. It didn't work. I guarantee you it didn't work. But grievous, nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. There's two questions I'm going to ask you. Number one, do you want to go to heaven when you die? Number one. Number two, are you tired of sin? Now, I'm going to preach, I'm going to preach straight out and I'm going to be honest. Some of you listening to me, either here or online, you are not yet old enough to be tired of sin. Because some sins take a while. But I guarantee you, the more whippings you get and the older you get with it, the less tasteful it is. That sin, I mean. The less rewarding it is. Roy doesn't mind me talking about this. I asked him the question the other night. By the time they put him in the treatment center, how much a day was he up to drinking? About a bottle and a half a day. Shoot, if you were to give me that half a bottle, I'd be dead, I think. But after a while, you're just drinking to stay normal. You're not drinking to get drunk. You're drinking to stay normal. And you realize that there ain't enough alcohol in the world to give you that first buzz that you got years ago. Does that sound about right? So I'm, listen, I mean it. Some of you listening to me are not old enough yet to be done with sin. You're, you are living in the correction years. And there's going to be a lot of it. You will pay the price. You'll realize. I saw a guy the other day walking around. He was an old, he had a Vietnam cap on. so. But he's carrying around an oxygen bottle. And my thought was, 
I guess you wish you hadn't got up to three packs a day. Because that's usually how it ends up. Three packs a day will end up with you carrying an oxygen bottle. Maybe it's something else wrong and I judged him wrong. I don't know, but that's normally how it turns out. So the chastening is not joyful. It's not supposed to be. But it's supposed to yield the fruit of righteousness. Eventually, you will be sick of it. Eventually, you will be sick of the beatings that you get. Eventually, you will be sick and tired of being corrected by God all the time. And God finally will have driven it through into your wicked, hell-deserving, sinful nature that you're not going to be this way anymore. So, wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. And there's healing, there's wholeness with God. But there is a caution. And he used the word bastard in verse 8. But if you be without chastisement, whereof all partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. So now, pastor, now maybe they do get to go to heaven. Well, Deuteronomy 23, 2 says, A bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. God said, no. Don't plan on it. You cannot despise God's correction. You cannot despise God's correction and still plan on making heaven your eternal home. It does not work that way. God says, if I cannot correct you, then you will not be a son of mine. Bastard shall not enter the congregation of the Lord, even to his tenth generation shall he not enter the congregation of the Lord. And God only carries down your wickedness down to your fourth generation. God said, a bastard shall not come into the tenth generation, I won't let them in. That means you and the next nine generations of your grandchildren will not be able to come in. God's serious about it. You know, you know as well as I do, there are some families that are, are so wicked, they, you know that every child they bring into this world is going to be just like them. You know it, don't you? And sure enough, their children and their children and their children. See, and it, then, then it turns into who's got the most tattoos. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to preach that, am I? Yeah, see that? I got that back when I was in Vietnam. I got that little tattoo there. And your grandson goes, yeah, see mine, Grandpa? <laughs> Zephaniah chapter 3, turn your Bible there. Now, why did I say that about tattoos? God said, don't get them. God said, learn not the way of the heathen. Do not what the heathen do. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 1. There are children who are not correctable. And everybody listen, woe to you if this be you. Zephaniah 3, verse 1. Woe to her that is filthy and polluted to the oppressing city. She obeyed not the voice. Listen to your Bible. She received not correction. Listen to the Word of God. She trusted not in the Lord. And I mentioned that story about going down to the training center. I did. I had it in my mind that I didn't need, that so I was going to be running the school not doing the school, that I didn't really need none of this. And I was wrong. So God had to change my attitude, and He did. And I was glad when He did. It made the week a little bit better. But she trusted not in the Lord. She drew not near to her God. I want everybody to listen to me for a minute. This house and this Bible will always be where God is. 
Always. Nobody, especially with you being an adult, nobody should have to make you read your Bible or come to church. Nobody should have to make you. You're an adult. But those, listen, I'm not stupid. It's not my first day on the job. I know those who are not listening to God because they are not near where God is. They are not near that. Her princes within are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves. You know what that means? You are surrounded by devils. They're, they're, listen, they're the ones really ruling over you. Her princes are lions and wolves. They're the ones who are telling you what to do. They gnaw not the bones till the morrow. Her prophets are light and treacherous persons. This is why people don't want to come to this church. They would rather go to a church that does not preach biblical correction, biblical morality, biblical standards. They will go... And there's a zillion of them now. Didn't used to be that way, but they're everywhere now. Everywhere. Her prophets are light and treacherous persons. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. So it's not sometimes, well, I, I just quit going to church. You quit going to the right church. And you started going someplace where you could still keep your sin and not be corrected for it. And I'm talking, there's even correction supposed to come out of the pulpit. I have to say certain things that I don't, you know me, I don't like saying them. Because I know generally what is going to follow. I've just been doing it too long. But I have to say them. I have to preach them. So people like this, rather than getting correction, will simply choose a church where they know they will never get it. So, verse 5, The just Lord is in the midst thereof, and he will not do iniquity. Every morning doth he bring his judgment to light. He faileth not, but the unjust knoweth no shame. Who in here, in fact, I don't want you to raise your hand because I don't want you to brag on it, but are you still not ashamed of your own sins? You can say amen if you want. And if it doesn't bother you to do some of the things that you've been doing, either A, you're not correctable and God has taken his hand off you, or B, God it just hasn't, God hasn't got around to it, he's waiting for it to build up. And who knows that the longer it takes for it to build up, the worse it's going to come out. But I want you to be scared about that. If God has not corrected you in a while, maybe God has already decided there's no use. There's no use. Proverbs 15.10, Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hateth reproof shall die. There are people. There are people who sit in good churches who will die and go to hell Because they faked their way through, but down deep in their heart, they quit letting God touch them for a long time. They are the unrebukables and the uncorrectables. Jeremiah 2.30 In vain have I smitten your children. They receive no correction. Your own sword hath devoured your prophets like a destroying lion. See how it works? When you start when you stop receiving correction, 
you will choose the other prophets. You will. Jeremiah 5, 3. O Lord, are not thine eyes upon the truth? Thou hast stricken them, but they have not grieved. Thou hast consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than a rock. They have refused to return. It got so bad with Israel at points in their history that they ate their own children or sold bird doo-doo to eat. They ate dove's dung. That's how bad it got with Israel throughout her Old Testament history. They continued to despise God's correction. And God turned... Listen, you have got to be some kind of reprobate to eat your own living child. What is wrong with you, you sick in the head thing, you? And yet, they did it. They did it. Jeremiah 5, 3, O Lord, are not thine eyes upon the truth? Thou hast stricken them, but they have not grieved. Thou hast consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. Jeremiah 7, verse 28, But thou shalt say unto them, This is a nation that obeyeth not the voice of the Lord their God, nor receiveth correction. Truth is perished and is cut off from their mouth. You know what that means? It means that God has judged you as being so good at lying about yourself and your sin that He just cut off the truth from you. No, no more Bible. You don't get God's Word anymore. And that's your hope and salvation. That's your comfort. He'll take it away from you. He'll take it away from you. And he'll go find somebody else that wants what's in this book. But he'll take it away from you. Isaiah 5. I want to wind this down. Verse 1. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard and a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done it? See, God even raised children that he couldn't correct. Even God did. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down, and I will lay it waste, and it shall not be pruned nor digged. There shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah is his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, behold, oppression, for righteousness, but he behold a cry. God's landed on my heart to say this, so I'm going to say it. And we'll say it first to my family. Then I'll say it to the rest of you. Some of you, some of you God brought here to this church because of what has, God has blessed uh, this ministry with. And I, and I really appreciate that. Those of you online, I mean, that's the reason why you're here. But I want, to ask, I want to ask a question. And I have to ask it first to my own family, then I have to ask it to the rest of you. I'm not going to be around forever. I'm not going to be here forever. I have no idea how long I'm going to live. I have, I have an even worse idea of how long it'll take me to die. So... I don't like to sit and think about it much. But I want to ask my family this first. 
If I wasn't here, would you still follow God with all your heart? I didn't say go to church. If I wasn't here, would you still follow God with all your heart? To my family first, I ask, not for an answer, but to think about it. If I'm the reason you're here, I'm not, you're not supposed to be here. There was a man, I preached his funeral here, and he was just one of those men that I knew there was a lot of family dynamic there, and I just knew that he was the one that, that was gluing the whole family together. And at his funeral, I preached this. I said, some of you in this man's family have been propped up by him, and now that he's gone, what will happen to you in your life? And, I mean, it, it did exactly that. The whole family busted up. The whole family busted up. So I have to ask the question. And you don't tell me the answer. You have to answer the question in your own heart and between you and God. Will you still serve God? If I'm not here. And then those of you online. I'm not the first preacher that's ever had a Bible. And I'm not the last one. So to those of you online. Will you still serve God? If God takes me out. If not. You were just wild grapes. Wild grapes. Lindsay, remember that. That's the name of the message. Wild grapes. I don't want any of my children to be wild grapes. I don't want my grandchildren to be wild grapes. Some of them are pretty sour now. They ain't ripe yet. Let's say it that way. They're sour until they're ripe. Amen. I don't want anybody in this church, anybody online, to miss heaven because of me, and I don't want you to miss heaven without me. So let your father chasten you, will you? Let him correct you, will you? I know it ain't easy. I've been through it. Didn't think I was going to live through it. But God let me. And I'm telling you that life is better with Him than without Him. Let's bow our heads. It looks cold out there. To everyone, I just want you to spend a moment with God and just ask the question. You know, why, why are you going to church? Why are you coming to this church? I'm not going to be here forever. I don't plan on going anywhere, but I'm not going to be here forever. I know it. And to my family first, will you still serve God? I'm sure my mother worried about me at times. But I made sure that I let my mom know, Mom, I'm still going to serve God. I promise you. So my mom don't sit and worry about me all day long. Whether I'm going to do right or not. And I say that to all of us. 
at some point get it settled. I am a child of God. And if I need correction, I want it. I want you to be like me. Every now and then, you know you did it. And you say, God, you probably need to get me for that. Don't let me get by with that, God. That's how you know that you're going to make it. Because you trust God's chastening. Not run from it. You trust it. You trust it. Father, you've taught me through your chastening how to trust you. You've taught me, God, that when you get me, it is for my own good. So I've learned to recognize it. I've learned to abide it. I've learned that I am going to live through it. And I've also learned that I want it and I'm glad that you did it because it still shows me that I am your son and I'm God. Nothing, nothing means more to me than that. Nothing does. But that is exactly the part of me that I wish to hand down and pass down to my children. I don't necessarily care if they get a piece of the life insurance. God, I don't necessarily care that who ends up with my car. I don't care. God, what I care about when I die is that I have passed down to my children that same love for you. That confirmed joy that the devil can never take away. Father, I pray, Lord, that you bless my family first with this message. Let it be a blessing to them. And then to this congregation and these faithful people. I love them and I thank you for them. And I don't plan on leaving this world anytime soon, but if this was the last sermon I ever preached here, I'd like for your people to know that you're still God. You're still God. So Father, help us to hear your word today. We need it. Thank you for being a faithful father to us and for not letting us get by with our own ignorance. We thank you, God, for chastening us. We thank you, God, for raising us. And we will worship you in eternity for all the good things that you imparted to us in this life. So, father, bless the words. Bless the message, I pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.